Before carrying out a deadly attack on the city of Denver in late December of 2021, Lyndon McLeod was a self-published author dedicated to alt-right philosophies, including the idea of masculine supremacy, who envisioned bringing about a new world order by targeting the weakest among us. Whereas most writers are capable of dissociating themselves with what they create on the page, Lyndon was not, and the horror he caused on the streets of Denver is still being felt by his victims' families to this very day. But did you know that the police and FBI were aware of his questionable activities? activities long before that fateful night, and yet nobody was ready to stop him when he finally snapped. So who was Lyndon McLeod and how did he become such a monster? Well, stay tuned to our newest installment of Before They Were Criminal to find out. According to some of Lyndon's acquaintances and his own autobiographical writings, Lyndon McLeod was born the son of an army officer and spent some time overseas as a child before returning to the United States and attending high school in Ohio. By 1999, he was in his mid-20s and followed a girl that he was interested in to the Zendik Farm, a new age environmental commune described by some as a cult who operate with the following slogan in mind. Stop and start a revolution. Now, according to Lyndon, he stayed at this commune for a little over a year before losing interest. Then, in the mid-2000s, he made his way to Denver, Colorado, and began working in what would come to be his most stable field of employment as a cannabis cultivator. It was during this time in Denver that McLeod would meet many of the people that he would one day later kill or try to murder. For instance, McLeod met one of his victims, Michael Swinyard, while working for him in an illegal grow operation out of a Denver warehouse. But even at this still early point in his life, McLeod's violent tendencies were rearing their ugly head. In 2008, an email correspondence with Helen Zuman, a former member of Zendik Farm, during many of the letters he would send to her, McLeod would wax poetic on the possibility of societal collapse while describing himself as a recovering leftist who's beginning to take interest in race relations and genetics. Yeah, that tends to be a pretty problematic pipeline. In some of these emails, he would even describe himself as a quote, Shiva the Destroyer archetype who likes to watch it burn. By most accounts, McLeod made good money in the sale of cannabis, and with a long-running passion for tattoos, he eventually decided to invest that money into a tattoo parlor. So in the early 2010s, McLeod and a few of his out-of-work tattoo artist friends started the All Heart Tattoo Parlor in downtown Denver. That is where, unfortunately, another one of his future victims, a man named Danny Schofield, worked for McLeod. But the shop wouldn't last long probably because McLeod constantly berated his workers and was absolutely terrible at managing his finances. Following the collapse of his tattoo parlor in 2015, McLeod's girlfriend at the time also left him. So he packed up all his stuff and left Denver for a property high on a mountain outside of the city that he had bought years earlier. That's where, while living in a tent, he built himself a home out of shipping containers. And it was inside this ramshacked abode that McLeod would later write the fictional series that he entitled Sanction. McLeod would self-publish Sanction in 2018 under the pen name of Roman McClay and sold it through Amazon with the tagline, the book that philosophized with a jackhammer. Yeah, whatever the hell that means, this would eventually evolve into a three volume series that followed a character using his real name of Lyndon McLeod who commits over three dozen murders. In the meantime, McLeod also operated a plethora of Twitter and Instagram accounts under that same alias, where he would gleefully indicate that some people required violence to be properly addressed. For instance, while discussing a 2014 YouTube clip in which Mike Tyson was recorded getting physical with a reporter, McLeod would write under his pen name that that passive aggressive reporter got what was coming to him, and that Tyson's use of direct aggression was 100% necessary. He wrote, this is basically the plot to my stupid book. Our entire society is made up of little to insult badasses and get away with it because law enforcement and societal norms protect the weak from the strong. I'm over it. The weak better buckle up. It's about to get real. Yo, just off script too. This guy's a bro. <laughs> I'm just saying this guy's a bitch. Man. It was also during this time that McLeod enjoyed his brief 15 minutes of fame by being invited on the podcast that pandered to the alt-right. Right now, I currently live in the San Isabel Forest uh, in southern Colorado. And uh, I live on 35 acres, and I'm surrounded by about a million and a half uh, acres of BLM land. But all of that would abruptly come to an end after he threatened someone and their family on Twitter, which led to an alleged visit by the FBI. In fact, this is where the story gets downright confusing. Because according to a ton of sources, McLeod clearly was on the authorities' radar for a number of incidents. They just chose to do nothing about it. And after the tragic events that were soon to unfold, Vice News would later identify at least three times in the two years leading up to what happened that the police were contacted about McLeod. Not only had officers responded several times to domestic domestic violence situations involving him, but the Denver Post even uncovered a story that McLeod had once threatened the people that he used to work with at the cannabis grow up with a firearm. 
and was forced to plead guilty to menacing. By late November 2021, McLeod had become more radicalized than ever, and it was in that month in which he traveled with his then-girlfriend to Salt Lake City to undergo a medical procedure, the details of which his ex was unwilling to reveal. While there, these two got into a fight over the procedure, and McLeod struck her for the very first time. So, she left him in Salt Lake City and would never see him again. A little over a month later, McLeod would go on a rampage. On Monday, December 27, 2021, McLeod entered Soul Tribe Tattoo and Piercing in downtown Denver at 5 p.m. in the evening. There, he shot and killed the owner of the establishment, Alicia Cardenas, as well as a tattoo artist, Alyssa Madonado while wounding Alyssa's husband, Jimmy. Far from finished, McLeod then exited the shop and headed off in the direction of a former friend's home named Jeremy Castillo. Jeremy had previously been McLeod's own tattoo artist and had helped McLeod get his original parlor off the ground before having a falling out with him in subsequent years. In his books, McLeod would write about how he believed Jeremy had betrayed him and would spend thousands of words outlining his contempt for him. On the night of the murders, Jeremy, his wife, their three-month-old daughter, and a friend were having a quiet evening, and when McLeod showed up after front door, dressed as a delivery driver. Jeremy's wife answered, but she found it odd that a delivery had come directly to their entrance. Suspicious, she did not allow McLeod in and told him that Jeremy wasn't around. Her suspicion likely saved her entire family's life, because 10 minutes later, McLeod returned. This time, he began smashing on the door with a sledgehammer and fired shots into the home through the door and walls. The family and friend managed to escape through a side roof and ran across the street where they took refuge in another tattoo parlor. McLeod would eventually break into their apartment and shoot up some of their belongings, but thankfully wasn't able to harm anybody. McLeod then proceeded to his former associate, Michael Swinyard's condo building. There, he shot up the lobby and forced his way into Michael's unit, killing the 67-year-old in a manner that bore a striking resemblance to what happened in the pages of Sanction. He then drove about 10 minutes to the Lucky 13 tattoo shop in a nearby strip mall where he shot and killed his former employee, Danny Schofield. Surveillance footage of this attack shows that he was in and out in under 10 seconds. By this point, Denver police were finally on his trail. In fact, they had already exchanged gunfire with him prior to entering Lucky 13, but McLeod managed to dodge the police and get away eventually abandoning his van at a different shopping center. That's when he began walking around, and at one point he even entered a restaurant and demanded a drink by pointing his weapon at people. Finally, he wound up in a hotel where he shot Sarah Steck, the front desk clerk, multiple times, and outside the hotel, he was once more confronted by police. Officer Ashley Ferris was wounded while exchanging gunfire with him, but managed to take him down in the process, killing McLeod outright. His horrific reign of violence was finally over, but McLeod would still look to get the last word. Less than two weeks after her ex had mercilessly killed five people, McLeod's former girlfriend received a strange package in the mail from beyond the grave. Inside it were the rights to his sanctioned series and a 47 minute movie on an SD card that he had shot and edited in his final days. The film titled War Horse contains footage that appears to tell McLeod's story the way that he intended it to be told. The postmark on the package shows that it was sent on December 27th, the very same day that McLeod went on his killing spree. After struggling with the decision on whether or not to post a video online, other members of McLeod's family got a hold of the footage and made it available on his website where they charged $10 a rental or $30 to own it outright with the proceeds of the video apparently being sent to the victims of the crime, although no media outlet was able to confirm whether or not that was actually the case. It's a chilling coda to close this story on, considering the horrific scope of the entire ordeal, but at least Lyndon McLeod is no longer around to hurt anybody else. The hope is that his disgusting philosophy and views ends right here with him, but with the way the world works these days, the truth is you just never really know. But for now, our thoughts and prayers go out to the victims of Lyndon McLeod's atrocious crimes. Thank you everybody for watching. Please take a moment to share your own thoughts on this story down below. And once you're finished with that, please take a moment to like, subscribe, or turn on your notifications. My name is Clyde Smith, and I'll see you guys in another video.